This is Musings of the Shy Podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. Here with episode 111, as we talk about ether, and is this the wave of the future? But before we get into ether, the news. And once again, the entire month of February uh, is open source, open source software month. But before we get into Ether, like I was stating, the news. This is from Inc. Uh, dot. Controversy rages over pro-slavery tech speaker Curtis Yarvin. Uh, if you're not an engineer, you're likely to have not heard of the Labanda Conference or Curtis Yarvin, a.k.a. Messenius Molbug. That the conference and the person are colliding, though, matters for the movement to diversity in the world of tech. Uh, normally, I don't read such salacious stories, uh, even though these are, this is pretty very um, factual, if you will. Uh, but eventually, um, on, on Word from the Metaverse, I'll be talking about the origins of the cypherpunk movement. And there is a very dark streak within not only the cypherpunk movement, but a lot of the movements within the tech industry that it has to do with um, uh, white supremacy, uh, misogyny, just... A lot of very ugliness, if you will, and even classness, if you will, as far as an elitist take on the economy, if you will, or economic growth of certain individuals or just people in general. But this article is by uh, Tess Townsend. Uh, the Bo- the Limbada confer- Conference, or CONFIN, is a conference revolving around a style of coding called functional programming. If you're not an engineer, you probably haven't heard of it, or at least not before the last two weeks when the gathering gained attention on Twitter for all the wrong reasons. Uh, The Memorial Memorial Day weekend event held this year in Boulder, Colorado, is hosting Curtis Yarvin, creator of the experimental computer function, uh, Yurbit, as a speaker. Yarvin's online writings writings and many under his pseudonym, uh, Menius Mulberg, uh, convey blatantly racist views. He expresses the belief that white people are genetically endowed with higher IQs than black people. He suggested race may determine whether individuals are better suited for slavery, and his writings have been interpreted as support of the institution of slavery. Conference attendees and speakers are expressed anger and frustration on Twitter, with many broadcasting their plans of whether to attend. Some sponsors have dropped out. A website has appeared for an alternative functioning program called uh, Munkaf, uh, slated for the same date in the same city as Lavadakaf. For his part, Yarvin himself has taken to the online for- platform Medium writing a 2,854 word prose titled Why You Should Come to Lambenkopf Anyway, in which he states he's not a racist, but I see why you think might think so in an email to Inc. Yarvin claims he applied to speak at Lambenkopf as to talk about Yurbit and not cause controversy. controversy. But part of a larger problem in the San Francisco Bay Area, people pushing for greater diversity in the world of tech says... What's playing out with uh, the Bond Conference has wider implication. Everyone I know who is not a white dude who has weighed in, weighed in has weighed in on this, the side of not supporting the conference. So Brian Brian, Brian CEO, and co-founder of Oakland-based cybersecurity startup uh, Cliff. He says programming conferences play a significant role in the careers of engineers as they do, f- they do for researchers and academics in other fields. For a startup like Cliff, which means explicit efforts to recruit a diverse staff, is a problem if minority coders feel uncomfortable at conferences. We know already that people are being pushed out of this career, Breiner says, and if minority programmers don't feel comfortable at conferences, that, that will only contribute to such a trend. Labba founder and chief organizer John A. D. Ghost wrote in a blog post that the conference decided to keep Yarvin as a speaker in order not to set a precedent of discriminating, discriminating against attendees because of their beliefs. Lavanikov does not and cannot endorse any of the widely different, uh, diametrically opposed, and controversial opinions held by the speakers, attendees, and volunteers and vendors, he wrote. His wife, Sophia, who helped him organize the conference, which is now in the third year, says in a phone interview with uh, Inc. that she and her husband do not agree with Yarvin's views, but they, but they and the organizers could not find reasons to disinvite his absent concerns that he would act violently. I guess by analogy, I wouldn't ban Muslims because other Muslims are extremists, she said. That is not a good analogy. As for Tuesday, she said that of the 80 speakers scheduled for the conference, about five have pulled out. She estimated that a handful, maybe three sponsors, have pulled out despite the mailstorm online. She estimated 350 will attend in May compared to the 
between 275 and 300 last year. Her husband says in a text message that he and his friends have been targets of online harassment, but he believes in allowing Yarvin to speak does not relate to does not relate to free speech. Curtis is not allowed to talk about politics at the conference. Viral is about respecting the separation between personal beliefs and professional life rights. The ghost. The fear of speaking out. Many who wrote on Twitter and the blog post that opposed uh, Yarvin's inclusion as a speaker has declined to speak with ink or haven't responded to inquiries. One passing teen who purchased a ticket but says he does not think he will attend tells ink. Some may fear that he they will be harassed online should they speak to the press. The tinny himself requires to stand in uni. I went to LC last year, and I've never felt more included around the tech community. I'm openly gay and a bit awkward, he writes in an email, and he praises the ghost for attempting to create an inclusive environment continues. Inviting Yarvin was a huge misstep. Tolerance of those who advocate intolerance towards a disenfranchised minority is not actual tolerance. John Sterling organized a Lombardic Conf workshop, and Perel Conf decided to cancel the workshop writing in an open letter. We cannot possibly organize a workshop under an umbrella of a conference that values the free expression of racist and fascist views or the physical and emotional safety of its attendees and speakers. Not all who oppose Jarvin's views say they will boycott the conference. The writers of a forthcoming book on the programming language, uh, Haskell, say that they're coming to support other speakers and attendees. Uh, they have a quote about it. Uh, history speaking, this isn't the first time Yarvin has caused controversy by applying to speak at a programming conference. The Strange Loop Conference last year announced it was rescinding an invitation for Yarvin to speak after speaki- speakers and attendees raised concerns about the mold bug writings. At the same time, Strange Loop creator Alex Miller said he decided Curtis' inclusion would overshadow the content of his talk and, and, be- and become the focus. Some think that Yarvin applies to speak at conferences, especially those that use blind speaker selection process such as uh, Lambo Lambda da Conf as a trolling tactic. Now that he's done it twice, it's clearly a stat- a strategy, says Valerie Aurora, principal, a diversity inclusion consultancy frame shift consultant. The true purpose is to get a bunch of people angry and fight on Twitter. Yarvin tells uh, Inc. that he applied to speak at Lamada Le- Conf to speak about his company, not draw attention to his personal views. He says he's spoken at other conferences, mentioning that he gave talks about Yar- both as Yarvin and as Mulbug at the to- 2012 uh, Bill Coulter and Technology Conference. Uh, Yarvin disputes that he agrees with the institution of slavery, but many interpret his writings as Skeed's supportive bondage of black people. He writes an email to Inc. I don't know if we can say biologically that part of the genius of the African American people is that t- the talent that they showed in enduring slavery. But this is certainly true in the cultural and literary sense. In any case, it's easy to admire a talent when one la- lacks it, as I do. Whew. So. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, there's a little bit more in the article, but I'm not going to read. But yeah, the, there is a very dark streak within the tech industry that has been been there from the very beginning. Many have attempted to combat it, to try to educate people, to try to thwart it in some way, to have not such a significant influence over the culture. But it's there, and it does have a significant influence. And we will get into that when we talk about the cypherpunks on a word for the metaverse. EU Privacy Watchdog says Windows 10 settings still raise concerns. We here at the Museums of the Shy do not use Windows and hate it with a passion. Especially Windows 10. The European Union Data Protection Watchdog said on Monday that they were still concerned about the privacy settings of Microsoft Windows 10 operating system despite the U.S. companies announcing changes to the installation process. The watchdog, a group made up of the EU's 28 authorities responsible for, for enforcing data protection, wrote to Microsoft last year expressing concerns over the default installation settings of Windows 10 and users' apparent lack of control over the company's processing of their data. The group, referred to as the Article 29 Working Party, asked for, the, for more explanation of Microsoft's processing of personal data for various purposes, including advertising. In light of the above, which are separate to the result of the ongoing inquiries at the national level, even considering the proposed changes to Windows 10, the working party remains concerned about the level of protection of users' personal data. Yeah, Microsoft has been, I would say, the last six or seven months, well, certainly within the last year since uh, the ending of the, uh, the podcast, or the pause, if you will, Microsoft has been actively being dragged for all the various privacy concerns, uh, there has been some data breaches. There have been significant bugs and crashes with Windows 10 in general. People are actually leaving Windows 10, and most of them are actually going to um, OS to Apple. But there are 
a greater increase in usage of Linux. Not as big as I think it should be, but people are migrating off of Windows 10, or they're just reverting back to Windows 7, rather than deal with all the issues that, that have to do with Windows 10. If you are a cryptocurrency user, you should not be using Windows 10, especially if you keep a wallet dat file on there, because that means that they potentially and strongly have it. I strongly believe they have it. Most importantly, um, because of hacking is a big thing. It's having having an increaser, increasing impact on the world, particularly when it comes to data breaches and personal information getting out there. Uh, we just talked about uh, Hal Finney's um, Bitcoin Talk account having been um, the password having been changed as a result of a hack that occurred the year before. Um, you know, Microsoft is just a hack waiting to happen. Um, your data, so whatever back doors Microsoft has, a hacker can get into. Um, so yeah, so the EU is strongly fighting about it. They have actually been going after Microsoft over a number of different issues. Some I disagree with, some of them I agree, do. A lot of it has to do with taxes and the payment of taxes within the European Union and even in um, individual countries have come after Microsoft about their um, tax havens and the lack of pay, if you will, to the coffers of the various governments. Uh, so that was from Reuters, and it was written by... Huh, it doesn't state on the top here. I don't like it when they do that. It doesn't state who the author is. Huh. That is weird. Ah. So if you are a user of Signal, and Signal is, has a stronger support, I think, on Android, and I think they pretty much use Android as a bit of a beta, but at the same time, it's much easier to develop programs on Android before it goes on the, to the OS. Uh, support for using Signal without a Play services. This is a big thing for people that have taken Android phones, don't like you Google, the Google Play service, and have removed it, basically have... Um, uh, what is the term? Unlock their phone, if you will. Not just unlock it from the carrier, but from the um, original OS platform, which is Linux. Uh, but in particular, that of the platform that is created and, and devised by Google Play. You can now uh, download Signal without Play service. Um, this, there's a link in the show notes to the GitHub, um, so you can review the code yourself. Support for using Signal without Play service is now possible in the beta calling, so non-GCM uh, users are a part of the beta calling by default. Which is great and important, especially since S Signal has now um, unleashed the, and it's still in beta, the uh, video calling um, addition to their platform, if you will. So now you can securely video chat with somebody without uh, anyone watching you. And that is it for the In uh, my new segment, I could call Nothing to See Here, in which we cover Bitcoin businesses that may have shut down due to the overhandiness of government or because a particular regulation has come into enactment. So bit license is trying again and Mountain Go shuts down. Uh, this article comes from Bitcoin.com by Jean-Pierre Buntix. Uh, Mountain Go, one of the US-based Bitcoin exchanges, has announced they'll be shutting down for good. The company tweeted that regulation was a key hurdle it could not overcome. Mountain Go confirmed that they've only shut down the exchange part of the business. As most of the Bitcoin enthusiasts are well aware, running financial companies in the U.S. requires adhering to specific guidelines. Moreover, every state has the right to issue their own set of additional regulations that they see fit. In New York, there is bit license, which makes it expensive and difficult to operate a Bitcoin business in the state. Montego business license denied. Uh, Montego applied for the bit license at the end of 2015, together with a handful of other companies. Going through this process is subject to a hefty fee, and there's no guarantee that enter enterprises, on enterprises will obtain the license in doing so. Now that the exchange is shutting down permanently, it appears that they, do not, they did not obtain their bit license. Although the, the details regarding the decisions remain vague, the company informs users of the impeding closure 
uh, Montego sent out an email to all his customers stating the following. We are writing to inform you that Montego will soon be closing our Bitcoin exchange. The date for, for the closure of the exchange is set for one week from today, Friday, the 3rd, uh, Friday June 3, 2016. We thank you for your patronage over the past year. Going forward, our team will focus on providing blockchain solutions. Given the fact that users only had a, only one full week to access their account, it seems to confirm that bit license is not being granted. Companies who apply for the licenses and fail to obtain it must shut down their services after receiving the verdict. It appears as, as that is what Montego is doing. Moreover, a tweet by the company seems to further validate the train of thought. Uh, regulators have good intentions with unintended consequences. Is there anything positive about bit licenses? It seems to be a valid question right now. Uh, but this regulation has been in effect for nearly a year now. There are very few companies who have obtained the bit license. Montego was one of the few companies willing to put the effort to secure it, and they seem to have rejected. In March of 2016, it been only apparent, it's become apparent only one bit license has been granted over an eight-month period. These numbers are not only, prom not only promising and beg the question of whether or not regulation is indeed useful. Big Bitcoin exchanges adhere to the traditional AML and KYC guidelines already, and there should be no need for further regulation. Bitcoin itself cannot be regulated in the first place, as there is no central control of authority. Companies dealing with Bitcoin conduct identity verification checks already, and there's little more that more they can do. Moreover, blockchain technology allows for all transactions to be traced in real time, adding a layer of transparency not found in any other form of money. So there you go. New York is going to be a desert when it comes to Bitcoin companies. The UAE's Bitcoin startup YellowPay has shut down. This is from TotalBitcoin.org. Bitcoin currency of the future. It's been predicted that Bitcoin will be the currency of the future. All right, let's get to the point. As for a moment, you can say that Bitcoin is somewhat like the Wild Wild West. Okay, YellowPay. What you need to know. YellowPay was a startup in the Bitcoin industry. It was largely a Bitcoin payment firm. While Bitcoin may be big news for many in the Western world, but it's not that big in other parts of the world. YellowPay was unique as it was a Bitcoin payment firm that started in the Middle East. It's also not hard to imagine that YellowPay was targeted to be the first Bitcoin payment firm in the Middle East and may be spread in its way to Asia. Unfortunately, things didn't go as planned. Recently, YellowPay has officially shut down. The company was formed in 2014 and by 2016 is already out of operation. It was a company with a big vision and even enlisted PayPal's former managing director as one of its senior advisors. With a big vision and a market right for taking and big names under its list, it seemed that YellowPay posed to make its mark. Despite its, trans tra despite its tra traction, the startup faced a lot of issues that led to its shutdown. YellowPay shut down without giving official reasons, leaves us with speculations. Some experts say that the company was having problems with the business model. Some experts say that it's focusing resources on spinning the benefits of digital currency is the reason for its spreading the benefits of digital currency is the reason for its downfall. Despite the LPA shutdown, the Middle East is still pretty much in the cryptocurrency industry. In fact, the Dubai government has partnered to host Keynote 2016, a conference that focuses on blockchain of cryptocurrency. It's also likely they will be still be hearing from LPA, or at least from one of its founders. Ula Dabam, one of the founders of LPA, is now starting a new Bitcoin-related company called Bit Oasis, and is getting support from the Dubai government. So it sounds to me like for this, you had to have government approval here, and or at least government monies or some type of government ties so forward for this company to exist. It might be the reason why YellowPay went down. Bitcoin tipping platform ZapChain to shut down by um, Pete Rizzo. Another Bitcoin-based content monetization startup has announced it will shut down. Social network ZapChain, launched in 2014 as part of the Accelerator Boost VC's fourth batch of startups, has told its users it will cease services effective the 31st of August. The announcement comes less than a year after the startup raised $350,000 in seed funding. The decision made public on the company's website marks the end of a project that once was one of Bitcoin's fastest growing projects and comes amid a decline in the number of consumer-facing startups seeking to launch its services on the Bitcoin network. The Bitcoin tip tipping platform Chaintip, for example, announced it sold its staff to Airbnb in April and that it was searching for a buyer of its intellectual property, uh, which didn't occur because they have shut down. No details are yet provided or whether ZapChain will seek similar sales. 
Despite these challenges, however, the concept that blockchains could come to serve as a vital part of the content monetization lives, lives on, most recently with the controversial success of social media platform Steemit, which we will eventually talk about, though it used an alternative to the Bitcoin blockchain. Representatives of Zap Chain could not be reached at press time. So there you go. Um, so we have an example of a Bitcoin regulation shutting down a company, the overhandedness of a government that you basically have to have ties to it to order for your, your company to function, in one example. And the financial model basis for one particular company was the reason why it shut down. So before we get into um, Ether, um, this last a bit, some Doge news or Doge connection to Ether. Uh, the Doge connection Bounty DAO is live and working. Previously on Doge Ethereum, a thread appeared on our Dogecoin asking about how hard it would be to create a side chain for Doge Ethereum, Ethereum in the molds of uh, BTC Relay. The thread gathered a lot of attention and Valta jumped in to give his opinion. Valta is the uh, one of the principal creators of Ethereum. Just a few days later, uh, Valta implemented in, in sort of a light client for Dogecoin in Ethereum, with the caveat that it would take a lot of gas to fully run, but he also had a game theoretic solution that would overcome that problem. As the Skype room was created by both Dogecoin and Ethereum developers to discuss what would would be a change to create a full, fully de- decentralized side change, the ultimate goal became being to create an Ethereum-based token that keeps its value at one one for Dogecoin and be used to run smart contracts. Some people started saying that they had an interest in setting up a bounty to help fund this development, so I created the DAO to manage those funds. I've added some members of the Ethereum community, Dogecoin developers, and Ethereum developers, but 100 Ether of my money to test it and created a proposal to refund it, so we could be sure that the DAO actually works. Yesterday, we finally were able to gather enough votes to execute it, and the test was successful. I was also able to execute a code, adding a new member, so that it's as far as I've been able to test it. The DAO works for both Ether transactions and code execution should be able to hold tokens too. This is currently the rules of the DAO. All proposals, in order to be able to execute it, need to be at least one week, 10,000 minutes old, and have at least five votes. Due to recently found founded code typo, is a minimum quorum instead of the more logical um, something else quorum. With at least three votes supporting it more than the number of the votes against it. The DAO has eight voting members. Myself, uh, Vitalik, he has two votes. Ming, Executive Director of the Foundation, Piper Murren, Independent Developer, Hudson Jamson, Community Members, uh, Soup to Color, Ross uh, Nicole, Dogecoin Developer, and George Halo Foundation and Ethercorp. Members can be added or removed. Minimum quorum voting time and majority margin can be changed only by putting up a proposal. Only members can be put proposals and vote. All proposals and votes are public, although see who voted on, on what you've had to get public logs, something that the current wallet doesn't support. If you want to donate ethers or tokens to the DAO, the address is here. If you want to watch the proposal and votes, you can add them to the wallet using these instructions. The full source code can be found on this gist. It's deployed and compiled using the official Ethereum GUI wallet version uh, 0.37. If you want to have any idea what it looks like, here's a screenshot after the first proposal was executed. So, and then our... Nicole, the uh, one of the premier Dogecoin developers, added this to the post. It's been pointed out we have an open bounty, bounty, but anyone trying to work on this will end up doing a bunch of work we've already covered. So basic idea is to make a two-way peg between Doge and ETH. Uh, background reading. Um, what we need to do is something like modify BTC Relay to handle Relay and Doge. There's a version of script for solidarity, uh, for solidarity that will be useful here, but I don't have a link to that handy. Just getting a prototype of burning coins to create them on the Ethereum chain is useful. Figuring out the protocol for freezing a thaw and doge. My thoughts so far are up at um, this post, which I'll read after this. The main issue with this suggestion is how we motivate miners to run Ethereum wallets and verify transactions going back from ETH to Doge. Uh, raise a PR for Doge Core, Dogecoin Core to reserve op codes as needed for the freeze slash thaw and talk to us about how we will soft fork that in. Modify BTC Relay to do the free slash thaw process. If you want to come to talk to Dogecoin Core devs, we're generally on free node most evenings and weekends. 
So this has been up for a year. I haven't seen any particular progress on this particular thing at all. I think the bounty is up to, with the price of ETH, about close to 60k, which is quite still a substantial amount of money. Um, it doesn't seem to be really much traction going on right now, and it might have to do with the fact that the value of Dogecoin is just, just not there. Even though the community is still pretty strong and its usage is still, there's still a lot of tra transactions, there's just, you might say there's just not a lot of um, development outside of the, the actual core usage of Dogecoin, which is just a monetary and fun thing to use. Thinking back to the Doge party um, bomb here, Dogecoin it, Dogecoins are burnt to form currency on a new chain in a one-way transaction for Dogecoin on Ether. Ethereum. We want to be able to move Dogecoin back from the Ethereum chain. To do that, rather than burning coins, we freeze them, resulting in generating on the side chain, and later we burn the coins on the side chain to thaw the freeze, freeze coins on the main chain. Looking at how elements chain side, side chains work, they've uh, used a federated peg to avoid a soft fork to introduce a side chain work verification um, op code. They do, however, talk about possibility of an op side chain proof verified in the side chains white paper. We have the soft fork to add um, op chat lock time verify anyway, so adding a new op ed code with that fork seems highly practical. This is a basic model as such. And then he goes into the detail and everything about how they go about doing this. Um, it's still very fascinating. Um, I wish more was being done for the, the, the Dogecoin community considering how much... Um, is happening within the Bitcoin community. I personally have had a, for the first time at ever, using um, Bitcoin, had a transaction dot drop. And what that means is because before it even got confirmed, it meant it was in a 20, oh, it was almost 24 hours of just being unconfirmed. Not one conf confirmation occurred. As a result, it got dropped. And because it got dropped, it got back into my wallet, and I wasn't able to make the purchase that I wanted to make. And it just, oh, pissed me off so much. Not to mention, when I went to go make that purchase the following day, I had to pay almost a 34 cents minor fee. Ugh. So there is significant issues with the whole blocks being filled and miners not just processing block things. It, they're not. They should be processing all transactions, period, in the story, whether they have a, f a fee attached to it, whether they have a high fee or not attached to it. They need to process their these transactions. And it's just it's just very frustrating. And a lot, a lot of people are getting more and more frustrated because it's, it's going to stall out. Even though the value of Bitcoin has gone up, it's is going to stall out because you're not going to have enough users or people using it. They're just going to hold because they can't properly spend their Bitcoin. And they're going to see more and more businesses peeling off either to other cryptocurrencies or staying out of the entire cryptocurrency market because, after all, this is just an experiment. Instead of taking it from the experiment into a practical use casage, um, I don't know seems that there's going to be um, some big decisions that are going to have to be made. Someone's got to put the big, you know, the big adult pants on and get get this done. So that's your little bit of Dogecoin news attaching to Ether. Um, we're going to talk about Ethereum. Um, I did use some Doge. I was part of the Doge Party burn um, when that happened a couple years ago. That since has... Um, moved into a different uh, counterparty. Actually, it is counterparty. Doge Party has become part of counterparty where you can um, have some tokenizations there. So that was a bit of fun. So what is Ethereum? What is their the Ethereum in itself and what is Ether? So Ethereum is an open source public blockchain based on distributed computing platform featuring smart contracting, scripting, or functionality. Um, we'll break down these terms, but I just want to kind of set the table, if you will. And this is, this is coming from Wikipedia. So, it provides a decentralized virtual machine, Ethereum Virtual Machine, or EVM. The virtual machine can execute turning complete scripts using an internal 
network of public nodes in a token called Ether. Gas is used to prevent spam on the network and allocate resources proportionally to the incentive offered by the, re by the request. Ethereum was initially proposed in late 2013 by Vitalik Burton, a cryptocurrency researcher and programmer. Development was funded by an online crowd sale during July through August 2014. Ethereum was initially described as a, in a white paper by Vitalik Buterium, a programmer involved with Bitcoin in the late 2013 with the goal of building a decentralized application. More especially, Buterium has argued to the to Bitcoin developers that the platform needed a more robust scripting language for developing application. Failing to gain agreement, no surprise here, he proposed development, development of a new platform with a more general scripting language. Beerton believes that many applications could benefit from the Bitcoin-like software. The Ethereum software project was initially developed in early 2014 by a Swiss company, Ethereum Switzerland, uh, Jimish, so especially a Swiss nonprofit foundation. The Ethereum Foundation was set up as well. Development was funded by an online public crowd sale during July through August 2014 with the participants buying the Ethereum value token Ether with another digital currency, Bitcoin. While there were early praises for the technical innovation of Ethereum, questions were also raised about its security and scalability. When we talked about Ether, it was launched as a project called um, Frontier. Launch Ethereum's live blockchain was launched on July 30th, 2015. The initial version of Ethereum called Frontier was a proof-of-work consensus algorithm, although a later version is expected to replace this with a proof-of-stake algorithm. Ethereum hard forks. Since the initial version, the Ethereum network has accomplished several so-called hard forks and important changes because of the they are backwards incompatible. The first hard fork the first hard fork introduced a difficulty bomb to incentivize an upgrade to the proof of stake within the system will be ready. The second hard fork, the Homestead release, the second hard fork was made in spring 2016 and marked the first stable release, Homestead. The third hard fork, the DAO. Okay, we'll, we'll, once we finish this little bit, we'll start. We'll talk about terms and we'll get back to the DAO. In 2016, the DAO platform for Autonomous governance of investment capital was found to contain an unexpected code patch which would allow a sophisticated user to withdraw an arbitrary amount of funds from the DAO. This was exploited by an unknown party on the 16th of June 2016 who managed to move about one third of the ether held then by the DAO at the time of value at 50 million USD into a clone of the DAO, a child DAO, whose control was held by only this party. As, co as consequences of the DAO was programmed, these moves, move funds would remain unavailable for the draw for about a month. The Ethereum community debated how and whether to reclaim the Ether and whether to shut down the DAO. As the decentralized nature of the DAO and of Ethereum it meant a lack of central authority that could take quick action, instead of requiring community consensus. After a few weeks' discussion on July 20th, 2016, Ethereum had a hard fork, a backward incompatible change, creating a new fork to reverse the hard and return the DAO funds with the original chain adopting the name Ethereum Classic. This is the first time any mainstream blockchain has was forked to reverse a transaction in order to make uh, reparations to investors in a failed enterprise. After the DAO fork, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic have both successfully forked multiple times to deal with other attacks. The fourth hard fork, uh, debloating and DOS protection. Towards the end of November 2016, a fourth hard fork took place. A hard fork successfully debloated the blockchain and attempted to prevent further spam attacks by, har by hackers. The Ether, the value token of the Ethereum blockchain, is called Ether, is listed under the uh, diminutive or uh, little acronym ETH and traded on cryptocurrency exchanges like any other cryptocurrency. It is also used to pay for transaction fees and, com and computational services on the Ethereum network. Tokens can be, uh, a vi can be volatile per circumstance, such as the Ether's plunge from $21.50 to $15 when the DAO was hacked on June 17, 2016. So let's talk about the terms of Ether and why it is very, very different from 
blockchain, or not, not blockchain, but Bitcoin. Smart contracts are applications with the state stored in the blockchain. They can facilitate, verify, or enforce the negotiations or performance of a contract. So just think of a contract just like you, your terms of services for, or your rent for anything that you use, or your rental agreement is probably more of a stronger analogy than terms of services. So your lease. You can develop that into a computer program where the landlord is um, one line of code, the leasee is another line of code. The date of when the service begins, like, um, you know, the first to the ending of the contract, uh, when payment is supposed to occur. So, for example, most people pay rent on the first, but sometimes, you know, you move in the middle of the month, so maybe it's the 15th. So whatever your due date is, but we'll keep it simple to the first of the month. So the first of the month is when uh, rent is due. Instead of having to deal with like a bank or a check or going down to the landlord and handing in cash or a check or any of that type of service and then getting back a receipt, what you would do is you would fill up the contract with the, the amount of ether necessary to pay for the rent. And every month that contract would um, remove just like you do uh, your banking services where your um, transactions are removed from your bank. Like if you have automatic, either automatic deposits or automatic withdrawals, we withdraw that amount and into the landlord's um, account, fulfilling the um, obligation of the contract. And then you can have other terms there. Like, for example, if, you know, the, the leasee breaks the terms of the contract or breaks the lease, there, then there might be something um, like the deposit, you know, is which is on the contract, would be uh, allocated back to the landlord. It would invoke the clause, if you will, and then that landlord would get that money. But say you're the um, you're the leasee and you fulfilled all your obligations and you want to get your security deposit back, but your landlord wouldn't release your funds. So then you can. Uh, invoke an arbitration clause. A person can look over to the contract, and then if they found in your favor, then you would get those funds back. If they found in the favor of the landlord, the landlord gets it. And then there's a fee for the arbitrator. So you can have all these sorts of protections. And a lot of this can be very automated where there's no actual human interaction. All of this is just done by computing code where it's just auto, all automatic. Boom, 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 boom. And these contracts can get pretty, pretty complex to depending on the need of the task or the series of tasks. And what it's come down to, and one of the biggest debates when it comes to the DAO, and we'll get back to the DAO, is whether or not smart contracts are actually legally binding contracts. And, you know, there's a piece in the state where, um, in the United States, where Arizona is putting forth legislation that smart, tra- smart contracts are legally legal binding documents. That anything put in the uh, blockchain can be considered a legally binding document, which is a step forward, but mm, a bit of concern, if you will. I think it's a little too soon for that. But there is an ethos, if you will, where law is code, where the program is the valid form of everything. Anything that the program has in it and what it is allowed and not allowed to do is the law, basically the law of the land. And you're, you're, obligated to abide by those laws and that's where the conflict with the DAO occurred because it became an issue three issues were whether or not smart contracts are valid to whether or not this individual who um, went into this particular DAO contract whether or not they actually um, fulfilled the obligation of the contract and were able to successfully uh, take the ether because that's what the contract allowed it to occur. Or three, was it a um, a bug, and therefore like a bad line of uh, code, and therefore wasn't valid. And this is where the conflict comes because is even if the bug is a flaw, even if it is a bad line of code, is it still fit with the ethos of law is code. If you coded badly, then this is the consequences of coding badly. And then it comes, you know, and this brings to the whole thing because you still have humans interacting with spe- machines, creating all this, and humans are very flawed. They don't see all their errors. So could you, could you 
really apply the law's code to an error, a human error, which created a bug that someone exploited, if you're that position? Or do you accept with the, the whole concept of law's code that humans are to create error, to error just is to be human, that you have to accept that as a underlying principle, and if there are errors, if there's bad lines of code, then that's the breaks. And that's why there's a fork, if you will, that there's actually two versions of Ethereum out there. There's Ethereum Classic that doesn't acknowledge the reimbursement of the DAO, and then there's Ethereum, which does. So that's what smart contracts are. And that was the whole hoopla when it came to Ethereum. Um, Ethereum, original, if you will, is um, the more profitable, has the most actions on it. Of the two, Ethereum Classic is still in there. It still has actually pretty significant value. Let me check what that value is. So Ethereum Original Edition is $12.60. Bitcoin, uh, just as a comparison, is trading above 1100 And then Ethereum Classic, compared to uh, Ethereum, is at $1.21. And the overall value of Ethereum volume for 24 hours is uh, 12 million plus, while Ethereum Classic is actually just below a million dollars. So there you go with that. Very interesting, very interesting stuff. Now the two more last bits that are actually a bit more complicated than um, smart contracts is a turning complete script language and the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, the simple explanation is that the Ethereum virtual machine, um, this is from Wicca, uh, which was a protocol defined in the Ethereum yellow paper by Gavin Wood. Uh, smart contracts would be written in a protocol called, uh, or a computing language called Solidarity, Solidarity and, Serp and Serpent and Viper, uh, derivatives of Python, and, and another one. Uh, the, EV, the EVM also runs on mutant depreciated. Uh, basically what it is is the way the nature of the protocol is that there's a the whole, entire network all acts like almost like a single computer with each of them doing these tasks to um, enable and allow for the smart contracts to occur. And basically what it is is just one massive computer that's working together. Uh, how is a little different from the Bitcoin protocol is just by the very nature of its computations and its purpose of what it is doing. And I think it's more so, it's more of a um, way they have established and set everything. It's more of a, um, a single computer than versus a very decentralized network, which is Bitcoin, where you can basically have the way Bitcoin set up, you can have everyone doing something different. I mean, we have have issues within the cryptocurrency space where you have people that use their nodes and they will blacklist certain um, Bitcoin transactions because they are drug buys. You have people that um, are just spies. They use that, that node to watch all the transactions to to track everything down, so they're basically like blockchain spies, as they're called. Um, even miners, the fact that certain miners or will not uh, say take a any or process any um, Bitcoin transactions that are have a mining fee below ten cents. You know, there's no cons consensus or protocol, computing protocol to for the network where there's a more stricter protocol with Ethereum where you can't do some of that. You Everyone's kind of operating on the same premises and there's not that much of a wiggle room there when it comes to the use of Ethereum. So it's a more single, co cohesive unit when it comes to processing these smart contracts. Which is where there's a bit of an issue when it comes to that because with all the nodes containing all the smart contracts and then processing them just like you would a uh, Bitcoin transaction, that's a significant amount of computing power and it could 
clog up the actual overall structure because um, not everyone's computer could process that as quickly as necessary, but also eventually not all computers can process it, um, all those co contracts um, fast enough. So a proposal that hasn't been acted is called something called sharding, where the Ethereum and engineers have been working on a thing called sharding the calculations, um, where the there basically will be um, making the, the calculations much, much uh, different to where it's possible for you to contain um, the contracts on your, your node. But the way the mathematical principles of the processing, it's, it's going to be fast. It's, it's going to be able to be valid and be on the network, but it doesn't take that much computing power to do so. It's distributed in a different mathematical way, but it hasn't quite happened yet. And the last bit is um, the turning complete, which is, of course, um, based off of the principle of the English mathematician Alan Turing. And basically what it is, is it's has to do with the computing theory computational theory about a system, and again this is Wicca, uh, data manipulation roles such as computers instruction set, programming language, or cellular amputation is said to be turning complete or com com computationally universal if it can be used to simulate any single tape turning machine. The concept is named after, again, after the English mathematician. A closely related concept is that the turning equivalency is two computers, P and Q, are called equivalent if P can simulate Q and Q can simulate P. So if both of these computers are capable of being each other and doing their every aspect of the, that, their existence, then that's turning complete. That is something that is possible. Um, the church turning thesis um, conjectures that any function whose values can be computed by an algorithm can be computed by a turning machine and therefore, therefore that if any real world computer can be simulated by a turning machine is a turning equivalent to a turning machine. A universal turning machine can be used to simulate any turning machine and by extension the computational aspects of any possible real world computer. So the non-mathematical usage is in colloquial usage the term turning complete or turning Equivalent are used by means that any real world purpose, general purpose computer or computer language can approximately simulate the computational aspects of any other real world general purpose computer or computer language. Real computers constructed so far are essentially similar to a single tape turning machine, thus, the associated mathematics can apply by extracting their operations far enough. However, real computers have limited physical resources, so they are only linear bound automation is complete. In contrast, a universal computer is defined as a device with a turning complete instructions set uh, infinite memory and infinite available time. Um, so because I guess you could say the lesser defined version of a turning complete is what Ethereum is doing um, because it's created a, a distributed network of this vast single computer You can say it has almost infinite available time if it's up all the time and it continues on forward to all existence, if you will. The whole infinite memory thing, I'm not positive on, but it has, you might can say, the lesser or simpler version of what is considered turn and complete is what is being done on the Ethereum network. And all it is is basically being able to universally do all these things within the program, that the language, the way it is done and constructed and the math, that is something that can be duplicated or done. Ugh. All right, I'm not going to... I have looked at the term of turning complete, and I personally am completely confused on it. Basically, so turning complete, a computer is turning complete if it can solve any problem that a turning machine can, given an appropriate algorithm and necessary time and machine, time and memory. When applied to a programming language, this phrase means that it can fully exploit the capabilities of a turning complete computer. 
A Turing machine is a computer that has infinite memory, infinite time, and can complete any transaction or any kind of mathematical computation, period. Actual computers have to operate on unlimited memory and are not turning complete in the mathematical sense. If they can run any program, they're equivalent to linear bound automat and a weaker th theoretical machine. Informally, however, calling a computer turning complete means that it can execute any algorithm. The ability to run any algorithm is necessary con condition for a computer to be called turning complete. For this reason, a basic cal calculator is not a turning complete, and neither is a scientific calculator that only evaluates a specific function. So, for Ether, because it's distributed network and because it uses the EVM machine and is using this distributed network processing power, you can say it does have a, an almost infinite amount of memory. Um, uh, infinite amount of time, I mean, if all the net, the networks and the protocols are all up, the nodes, the miners, everything is up, then I guess if it's running 24-7, it does have infinite time. So, in theory, it does, um, it is, uh, it does fit that um, term. Whether or not it's going to stay that way in the long term, if there's any cracks in it at all, is remains to be seen. It seems that um, the way they have programmed Ethereum with the EVM machine as a, a network, network, um, the network protocol, um, and the way they're constructing these smart contracts, then yeah, it could, in theory, do any type of algorithm um, with this particular protocol. Um, I think it's a bit ambitious for them to call it turning complete. I think there, there has been some debate whether or not Ethereum actually meets that. But it's probably one of the first steps towards a either protocol or machine that gets very close to meeting that criteria of having infinite time and infinite uh, memory and doing any type of algorithm. So that is the definition of Ethereum and all its uh, components. Now I'm going to break it down, Ethereum's two Ethereum's. Um, it's explained by Coindesk. It was written by Alice Hurton. Um, so what started as an attempt to rescue invent investors' funds in the high-profile project has resulted in a schism that has effectively split the community on the second-largest public blockchain. The split is not only psychological. Thanks to the design of the public blockchain system, it is also technical with competing visions manifesting into two very real blockchains, or versions of the project's transaction history. As of this weekend, there are now two groups working on two competing versions of the project called Ethereum, a blockchain-based platform designed to enable decentralized applications and development. If Bitcoin envisioned how a distributed group of users could create and manage a currency, Ethereum sought to allow distributed groups of users to create and manage a decentralized, uncensorable app store. However, there are now two slightly different versions of the platform available to users. Ethereum, the official version of the blockchain maintained by its original developers, and Ethereum Classic, an alternative blockchain maintained by a wholly new team. Both offer the same technology platforms, and according to developers, they are in agreement on a formal roadmap of steps forward. But the small difference have created two markets, both with a combined value of roughly $1.2 billion. That was, this article was written back in July, right when the, all this was happening. So I think that some of that has changed. How did we get here? Let's start with the DAO. Long the most notable Ethereum project, the DAO, short for Distributed Autonomous Organization, raised $150 million in Ether. See, that's where the problem was, and many cite this, and even can, including Valtic, uh, about the significant issues with Ethereum and why they're having this, these problems so early on. It's because of this crowdfunding um, sale that there was so many pumped into the network that it was just a matter of time before somebody comes around and hits somebody in the back of the head and, and takes their money. Um, the cryptocurrency of the Ether network. Earlier this year, during a public crowd sale, held online, anyone who had Ether could participate. The idea was simple, in theory. Investors could spend money through the DAO and receive voting tokens, and those who invested and voted would decide dem democrat democratically how the DAO should disperse those funds. Just as votes were starting to be held, however, the DAO was hacked or attacked or otherwise compromised, depending on your point of view. The sum in the academic community, the early problems were obvious and debates about their severity have already begun. But this all came to a halt when an individual or individuals use a valid action in the code 
to withdraw the funds to another DAO he or she controlled. To the Ethereum platform, the action was valid to the extent it was able to execute according to the contract terms. To others who invested, it was a much more contentious action. Skipping ahead, the Ethereum community eventually held a vote with the majority of the participants agreeing that they wanted to change Ethereum's code to get the funds back to investors and away from the attacker. Enter Ethereum Classic. What happened next is that a small minority disagreed with this choice and then took action. While the majority argued that blockchains can and should be altered if enough people agree, other developers asserted that in order to prove a sound history, a blockchain has to be censored, ship resistant, and free from tampering. So instead of making the switch when Ethereum created an entirely new blockchain, the vocal minority continued to mine the old version of the blockchain. Effectively, Ethereum Classic is a parallel version of the blockchain where the funds were never refunded to either owners who lost funds in the demise of the DAO. Ethereum, by contrast, is a blockchain has moved those funds to another address. But this seems small disagreement had an outside impact. The Ethereum Foundation responded to the DAO debacle in the worst way possible, reads the Ethereum Classic website and explains further. We believe in the original version of Ethereum as a world computer you can't shut down running irreversible, irreversible smart contracts. The project organizers followed with a crypto manifesto outlining the rules that the blockchains are supposed to follow in their eyes, including openness and perhaps more um, vitally immutability. The idea that one transac once transactions are made in the case of hack, they shouldn't be reversed. Not all blockchains are created equal at reads, and by staying on the unchained version of Ethereum, they're preserving these values. I will read the crypto manifesto um, after this article. Who is involved in Ethereum Classic? Uh, the Ethereum Classic team currently has four developers, according to this lead organizer named Evoco. But theoretically, anyone can join, just like the Ethereum itself. Ethereum Classic is supported by an open source community. A number of no notable developers has also voiced an interest in helping the Ethereum Classic project, including early Ethereum CEO uh, Charles Hoskin, who left the team in 2014 over differences in differences. What's important to note, though, is the blockchain is not merely being supported for ideological reason. A growing number of Ethereum miners have devoted computational power towards the classic blockchain, seemingly because they see value in securing its transactions and winning the associated mining rewards. At press time, the hash rate for the network was uh, 540 GH, or about 13% of the Ethereum network's hashing power, an arguably impressive figure given that the blockchain has only been around for a matter of days. So why is it profitable? The question of what gives Classic Ether's value is still up to debate, but in short, it has value because people believe in a project and those interested in supporting it can invest in or speculate on the market now that it's listed on exchanges. Since Ethereum Classic is essentially a clone of the digital currency, Ether holders can now make money from ba by making an account on the Ethereum Classic version of the blockchain or duplicating their balance. Ethereum Classic is a replica of the original blockchain, except for a few key changes regarding the DAO transaction reversal. Everyone who had tokens on Ethereum at the time of the fork now have, has the same amount of tokens on Ethereum Classic. To traders, it's essentially free money. If you owned $100 of Ether at the time of the fork, when it was worth roughly $12, you've had about 8 ETH, which means you now have 8 ETC, or an extra 16 bucks. However, those who held more Ether now have a lot more free money. This has since caused problems for exchanges, as if they don't want to be don't want to list classic ether tokens. They're arguably holding that what could be called a customer's funds anyway, simply by possessing ether at the time of the split. But major exchanges have picked up the alternative Ethereum coins, so it's now possible to trade ETH for ETC. Uh, this has since been um, kind of corrected. When well, that's no longer possible uh, with the various forks on both networks. Well, who's impacted? Ethereum token holders are in both blockchains could be effectively affected by replay attacks if they don't properly separate their addresses to differentiate them on each blockchain, which looks like a complicated process for each individual user to follow. Since, again, much of the Ethereum Classic is the same as the old network, most users with balances on one of them can use it on the other, but this could theoretically result in some funny mistakes like unintentionally moving funds on one of the other networks. Uh, Paul Nix has decided to automatically take precautions for his users. An Ethereum creator filed a weird suggest that either classic update is code to solve the problem, um, which it did. What does it have to do with Bitcoin? Speaking of the important takeaways, whatever happens with classic is a new insight that might be used in Bitcoin. Um, yeah, this could be a, a case study about what could happen if the Bitcoin block size 
debate isn't settled, where you have basically two competing um, courses of action, which are Bitcoin, Bitcoin uh, SegWit, and Bitcoin Unlimited. And we'll eventually talk about all the competing proposals to to address the issue that's happening with the um, blocks, blockchain of Bitcoin. So this is a mess. This put a big stink on Ethereum. Um, there's still to this day two competing blockchains. There's um, still a bit of little animosity about this whole matter. Um, th just a couple months ago, there was a uh, movement of the DAO uh, funds, if you will, the Ether funds that were trying to go to different exchanges to cash out. So the hacker still came away with quite a bit of chunk of uh, ether. There's also a lot of uh, contracts that are with the DAO that haven't been, um, I want to say fulfilled, but people haven't cashed out even though they could. So there's a lot of uh, ether associated with a lot of uh, smart contracts still with the DAO. The DAO in itself as a organization has pretty much collapsed, if you will. Um, no one really would like to do anything with the DAO as an organization. Uh, the concepts, though, um, people are very, you know, the whole smart contracting are very fundamentally interested in. That's the whole purpose of Ether. But any of those developers or any association, people are making a very um, big difference or strong, you know, distance from them. A lot of individuals that have um, entered the smart contract space, they're now, you know, testing out their smart contracts, seeking out any and all vulnerabilities before making any kind of issuance so that they themselves will not have the problem or dilemma that the DAO had, which a lot of people are wondering why the DAO didn't do that, why they didn't test it out, put it on the test net, um, seeking out auditors or anything like that. There was even an issue of the type of auditors they did get. Um, and then there's some that think that this was deliberate and that the members of the DAO actually are responsible for this bug and the taking of the funds. So it was just a huge mess and it was unfortunate, but the fact that Ethereum has in fact survived thus far, um, I mean, it's only been a few months really. And this happened in June, so we're in February of 2017, so it's it's not that been that, that long ago. It's not, we'll see what happens with the. Um, any future updates with Ethereum, as well as when we roll around to the year, what year, one year anniversary of this hack, um, what the state of Ethereum is, is at. Um, in general, what it has demonstrated that smart contracts are here. They are here to stay, but they need to be done better. It's fundamentally at the core issue here. In the last bit of DAO news, rebounding the DAO, the contentious blockchain concept is back. Um, this article is by Alyssa Harrington. Uh, this came out in f this month of February. So it looks like we haven't seen the last of the, the leaderless blockchain-based companies. Despite spectacular demise of the DAO, developers are still excited about the concept of one day creating decentralized autonomous organizations, automated companies operated by hardcore rules enforced on the blockchain. As evident by discussion at the Ethereum Development Conference, EDCon 2017, nearly six months after the project lost millions, millions experimenting, experimentation remains ongoing. Since then, Ethereum developers have been more cautious about rolling autonomous organizations. Um, I just mentioned about how they are um, doing more tests and more audits and making sure that before they release any type of smart contract, that is been proofread to the nines, if you will. As someone has gone through and t whipped out the, the, the code equivalent of the red pen and circled all the spelling errors and corrected all the run-on sentences and making sure that the code um, is up to snuff. A uh, new paint. Despite skepticism, the idea is far from dead. It's, hard to, it's a hard idea to eradicate. Perhaps because developers see such promise in a system whereby business decisions are automated to degree that power bureaucracy can be eliminated, can be limited. Even the developers behind the DAO announced in November they plan to release a new DAO for charity projects. 
The hope seems that they won't that they won't make the same mistakes or new ones this time around. Other upcoming DAO projects are a little bit more hesitant and announced that they are indeed an alien DAO. So take for example Colony, a job market platform that recently entered beta. While the founders wrote over a year ago that the platform would make DAO as easy as a Facebook group today, it doesn't mean that DAO, it doesn't mention DAO on the home page. So again, a lot of people are once again stepping away from from the DAO in itself, the concept of the word, as well as the people involved with that company. Ready or not, outside of rebranding effort, however, there's a, re a recognition that the concept in itself might need iteration. It needs some more work. Berkham Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University Research fellow uh, Prima de Felipe told Coindesk, uh, Coindesk, the DAO showed that we cannot assume that the system will work as we expect it to work. Her talk at uh, Edicon centered around the DAO she helped to create before the DAO, a planetoid or robot plant that accepts microtransactions. Now she suggests that the whole new type of management system is needed to address the issues developers have since discovered. We can't have this autonomous, autonomous system that will stay at, as it has been programmed because we obviously cannot foresee all possibilities, she said. Others are pressing ahead. Argon wants to launch sooner, though it will take at least half a year before the project is ready. Argon tech leader Jorge Inares noted that they are working with Zeppelin, with others, Ethereum, and smart contract templates that have been wider testing. Beyond that, the group plans to subject their code to a security audit and to simulate some real use cases on the main Ethereum network before rolling into wider use. So, it's nice that the concept, again, is not dead, um, and that people are taking these cautions, but like I said, it, it, I would like to see like a year out what people's feelings are and how much progression has occurred. So this is the Ethereum Classic Declaration of Independence. Uh, let it be known to the entire world that on July 20th, 2016 at block 1,920,000 was a community of sovereign individuals stood united by a common vision to continue the original Ethereum blockchain that is truly free from censor censorship, fraud, or third-party third interference. In realizing that the blockchain represents absolute truth, we stand by in supporting its immutable, immutability in its future. We do not make this declaration lightly, nor without forethought to the consequences of our actions. It should be stated with great gratitude that we acknowledge the creation of the Ethereum blockchain platform by the Ethereum Foundation and its founding developers. It certainly can be said without objection that without their hard work and dedication, that we as a community would not be where we are today. From its inception, the Ethereum blockchain was presented as a decentralized platform for applications that run exactly as programmed without any chance of fraud, censorship, or third-party interference. It provided a place for the free association of ideas and applications from across the globe without the fear of discrimination, while also providing um, pseudonymity. Is this decentralized platform many of us saw great promise? A list of grievances. It is, however, with deep regret that we as a community have had to spontaneously organize to defend the Ethereum blockchain platform from its founding members and organization due to a long trend of abuses, specifically by the leadership at the Ethereum Foundation. These grievances are as follows. For rushing the creation of a software, software which compromise, comprise of a minor change to the Ethereum blockchain code for the sole purpose of creating a blacklist and censorship transactions that normally would have been allowed. 2. For neglecting the full implication of the software by Ethereum blockchain as a warning that they were violating the principles of the value codes thereon. 3. For creating an unrepresentative voting mechanism called the carbon vote, which they initially stated was unofficial, only to contradict these statements a day before determining to hard fork. 4. For rushing the creation of a hard fork, which was compromised of an irregular state change in the Ethereum blockchain code that violated the properties of immutability, fungibility, and the scantity of their ledger. Or this, the sanctity of the ledger. Five for willfully deciding to to include replay protection in the hard fork as an action which has necessary necessary cost exchanges and thousands of users the rightful ownership of the ether tokens. Respecting the values essential for the blockchains, one might ask what harm can be done from changing the code of the Ethereum blockchain and bailing out the DAO to token holders, which is not an unreasonable question. Many of us have an innate sense of right and wrong. So at first glance, rescuing the DAO felt right. However, it violated two key aspects of what gives peer-to-peer -peer cash and smart contract-based systems value. Fungibility and mutability. Immutability means the blockchain is invulnerable. 
The only valid transactions agreed upon via cryptographic protocol determined by mathematics are accepted by the network. Without this, the validity, the vid- the validity, uh, without this, the validity, without this, the validity, validity uh, of all transactions could come into question, since if the blockchain is immutable, any transaction can be modified. Not only does this leave transactions open to fraud, but it may spell disaster for any distributed application running on top of the platform. Fungibility is a feature of money where one unit equals another unit. For For instance, a euro equals another euro, just as Bitcoin equals another Bitcoin, which is not quite true because you have blacklisting happening in Bitcoin. But I digress. Unfortunately, in ETH, no longer equals another ETH. The alleged attacker's ETH has no longer is no longer as good as your ETH and was worthy of censorship deemed necessary by a so-called majority. Ultimately, these breaches of fungibility and immutability were made possible by the subjective, subjective morality judgments of those who felt a burning desire to bring the alleged attacker to justice. However, in doing so, they compromised a core pillar of the Ethereum just to do what they felt was in the interest of the greater good. In a global community where each individual has their own laws, customs, and belief, who is to say what is right and wrong? Deeply alarmed that these core tenets were disregarded by many of the foundation developers and a sizable portion of Ethereum participants, we as a community have organized and formed a code of principles to follow by the Ethereum Classic chain. The Ethereum Classic Code of Principles. We believe in a decentralized, censorship-resistant, permissionless blockchain. We believe in the original vision of Ethereum as a world computer that cannot be shut down, running irreversible smart contracts. We believe in a strong separation of concerns where system forks of the code base are only possible when fixing protocol level vulnerabilities, bugs, or providing functionality upgrades. We believe in the original intent of building and maintaining a censorship resistant, trustless, and immutable development platform. Herein, as written, the declared values by which participants within Ethereum Classic community agree, we encourage that these principles do not principles not be changed via edict by an individual or fraction claiming to wield power, authority, or credibility to, to do so. We as a community agree that, one, the purpose of Ethereum Classic is to provide a decentralized platform that runs decentralized applications, which execute exactly as programmed without any possibility of downtime, censorship, fraud, or third-party interference. Two, code is law. There shall be no changes to the Ethereum Classic code that, vi- that violate the properties of immutability, fun- fungibility, or the scantity... The scantity, the sanctity of the ledger, transactions, or ledger history cannot, for any reason, be reversed or modified. Three, forks and slash or changes to the underlying protocol should only be permitted for updating or upgrading the technology on which Ethereum Classic operates. Four, internal project development can be funded by anyone, whether via trusted third party or their choice, or directly using the currency of their choice, or per project basis and following transparent, open, and decentralized crowdfunding protocol. Five. Any individual or group of individuals may propose improvements, enhancements, or upgrade to the existing or proposed Ethereum Classic asset- assets. And six, any individual or groups of individuals may use Ethereum Classic decentralized platform to build decentralized applications, hold crowd sales, create autonomous organizations slash corporations, or any other purpose they deem suitable. The many reasons listed above, we have chosen to rename the original blockchain Ethereum Classic with a ticker symbol ETC so the community and all other participants can identify the original, unforked, and immutable blockchain platform. Our most sincere gratitude goes to those developers within and outside the foundation who oppose interfering with the Ethereum blockchain ledger and enabling the Ethereum Classic chain to thrive and live. We know there are many of you, and we welcome you at any time to join our decentralized community. We will continue to the vision of decentralized go- governance for the Ethereum Classic blockchain and maintaining our opposition to any centralized leadership takeover, especially by the Ethereum Foundation, as well as the developers who repeatedly stated they would no longer develop the Ethereum Classic chain. We likewise will open, openly resist the tyranny of the majority and will not allow the values of the system to be compromised. As a united community, we continue to organize for the defense and the advancement as required for the continuation and assurance of this grand experiment. The Ethereum Classic platform is code and technology and are now open to the world as open source software. It is now freely available for all who wish to improve and build upon it. It is fr- it's truly free and trustless world computer that we, together as a community, have pr- proven and will continue to prove is anti-fragile. The Ethereum Classic community. So that's pretty much what Ethereum is. It basically, it boils down to is a, a decentralized uh, supercomputer that can process smart contracts. 
um, Dogecoin, there is, again, there's a bounty to allow for uh, Doge and ETH to, in to interact with one another. Um, doesn't look like, considering the bounty's been out for a year, that something's going to happen anytime soon. And given some of the problems that have happened already on the Ethereum network, it might be a while. But, last tidbit is, here are, um, uh, here in the, uh, show notes is the actual, uh, jest for that particular, uh, Dogecoin, um, <coughs> Um, bounty if you want to, Dogecoin ETH if you want to look at it. But that is it for the show. Uh, until next time, thank you for listening and to the moon. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.